She received an MA in English from the University of Nebraska Omaha and is currently working on a PhD in English creative writing at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Our poetry and fiction have been recipients of the John H. Freeland Graduate Award in Writing, first prize in the Mari Sandoz Prairie School of Fiction Contest, first prize from the Academy of American Poets, and a short story received a nomination for the Pushcart Prize in 1984. She's also received a fellowship at UNL for a collection of original short stories. Lorraine has taught writing at the UNL Community Writers Workshop, Creighton University, and Metropolitan Community College, as well as in the artists and the school programs at the Nebraska Arts Council. Her poetry, fiction, and nonfiction have all been, have been published in the Douglas County Gazette, All My Grandmothers Could Sing, Plain Songs, Prairie Schooner, and others. Please join me this evening in welcoming Lorraine. Thank you. I didn't know whether I should read fiction or poetry tonight, so I'm going to mix it up a little. I'm going to start with a few poems, and then I'm going to read a short story, a um, fairly short story, and then I'll end with a few more poems. Um, the first poem I want to read is called Babichka's Funeral. And Babichka, uh, do any of you know, it's uh, Czech for grandmother. And so this is a poem about a grandmother, Babichka's Funeral. Her children, remembering her for pastries and parades, have covered her casket with sprays of roses, unbecoming her, cherubic old lover of marigolds she recycles year after year, squeezing seeds like black slivers from frosty pods, covering them with dirt in her yard too small for roses, too humble for any other flowers. She was never too tired to take us, they recall, gathered around her casket. How she loved clowns, all powdered and costumed as they marched down the street. Her pastries, powdery too, covered with sugar and icing, fillings of fruit, black specks of poppy seeds, offered company beating marigold paths to her door. I want flour, she told us year after year whenever we asked. Give me baking powder, sugar for Christmas. Gifts she'd recycle in pastries plumped into our mouths, warming holidays for herself. Now we circle around while she, powdered and costumed, lies covered with roses draped in a spray. Outside the door, a black hearse leads the parade lighting up on the street. She's wearing her favorite dress, a bright shade of marigold, clashing with roses, roses cascading as if they were naturally growing that way, as if she were riding afloat to the grave. Um, this, these are older poems. Um, this one, I, it was in the collection called All My Grandmothers Could Sing, and I guess um, I might explain where I got the idea for the poem. I took my children a few years ago to the Sachs Aerospace Museum, and on the wall there was a display of an airplane dropping a bomb, and a, the, whole, the whole day at the, the museum was sort of upsetting to me. Um, I lived in Omaha all those years and never visited it before. And um, I guess when I saw the airplane and the bomb dropping, I was thinking about, you know, an analogies as poets do. And I was thinking it looked like an air, uh, looked like a bird dropping, dropping. <laughs> and um, then I got to thinking about birds laying eggs and things rising and things falling. And somehow that's how this poem got started. It's called summer 1945, and it's in four sections, May, June, July, August. May, four years old, my first birthday party. I hold wooden pins waist high, drop them one by one, head first, the bottle, small mouth, my target. I listen for the loud plunk against glass bottom to tell me I've won. Bullseye, a helium balloon, my prize, it flies upward, but before I'm home, it's out of my hands, snags a tree limb, burst. June. Visiting Grandpa's farm, I collect henhouse eggs, 
ripped each from its nest, trembling not to drop a single one. Success. With bedtime comes reward. He said, finally, I'm big enough to use the outhouse. Decrepit, dark pit with wooden sides whitewashed by birds. Two dark holes, the cover for a target, deeper than I'll ever care to look. July. In grass beneath our backyard elm, handing clothespins to my mother who strings laundry on the line, I find a robin egg intact. As I decide to climb the tree to replace it in its nest, a black grackle dive bombs mother's shining sheets with mulberry stains and gets me too. August. Nagasaki and Hiroshima are words too big for my small mouth. Though I know what a target is, I have to ask my mother if atom bombs are like balloons. I'm old enough to know what's meant by flight, have learned what winning is, and better understanding the depth of fear. Um, the next poem is um, one I wrote about another grandmother. All, all my grandparents were Czech, and so, um, this is one that was, I've written a lot about uh, my family and um, plan to even write more as I slowly uncover memories, but I had a grandmother who lived next door to me my first seven years, um, and my, my memory of her, and if I, if I could trust my memory, um, it wouldn't be anything other than my grandmother sitting out in her flowers. Now, I know that's not possible. I, knew, I know she had to do other things besides sit out in her garden. But um, that's what prompted this poem, is that very strong memory I have of her. Um, this, this poem has an epigraph. The title of the poem is The Last Wild Passenger Pigeon, and the epigraph is from Vance Borgeli's Country Matters. In 1914, the last passenger pigeon died. She was a female, and her single life in the zoo kept extant the most numerous game bird species ever known for 14 years after the final sighting of free birds. And then the poem starts. That was 1899, the year my grandmother sailed from Prague, landed on Nebraska's plains. But what died with the century remained long in her, so grandfather told, working slave labor five years to pay her passage. I've seen photos firm-figured bride in mauve gown, cheeks pink flowered, eyes ablaze. This might have been some lark she undertook to free herself from history, centuries shackled by oppressive might. Here they wander the state like gypsies, migrant farmers, footloose. I don't know when it changed. In 1914, the war began to break the world in two. The crash of 29 passed into depression. Doubly hard, Hitler invaded her other home. I know she never went back, lost a son in World War II. But who can say why the memory that burns is the one I carry, will not cut loose. Aged, she is perched on a backyard stool, her dull, fixed eyes gazing at flowers, her garden filled, as if staring long enough and hard, she'd bring it all back. As if she might still, a soft, full-breasted dove, recall her early flight. This um, next poem is one that was in last summer's um, Prairie Schooner, the Nebraska issue. And um, I grew up in a place called South Omaha. And um, one of the places we used to like to go this may seem strange, um, was down by the Missouri River uh, where the sewage came out. And it was before the sewage treatment plant was built. And uh, when I was young, that seemed like a very interesting place to go. And this is a narrative poem about um, an, an event that happened one of those times when we were there. The poem is called Miracle at Stink Creek. We call the place Stink Creek Stench invaded our nostrils like foul incense while we knelt on the banks above a city's waste. Curious kids, we were not the stuff of heroes. 
Sunday mornings, we gathered at that scene, fastened to a spewing spout of sewage by the abominable objects of our fascination, the evidence of excrement. Born through network underground, a buried tube, alive, the newborn lamb's arrival at the river seemed miraculous. He shot with refuse from the sewer pipe to a pool the Missouri drew into swifter streams. We braved a water world of debris and swirling, churning froth. With a pole, we fished him in. Aborted, premature birth, expelled from the womb, his mother slaughtered. Whatever caused the cast-off lamb, coat of filth, a discard from the packing plant floor, escaped somehow, death at delivery, death by disease or drowning. We dragged him ashore, wrapped newly neonate in nylon jackets fit only for Monday's wash. Dripping, astonished, we carried him home, proud parents handing out ribbon cigars, awestruck king bearing gifts of gold perfume. Um, I think I'll read this story. I don't know how long it's going to take. It's a fairly short story. It's uh, mainly one long scene. It's done uh, predominantly in dialogue. And what prompted this story, I, I was practicing writing stories uh, using a lot of dialogue to characterize um, my characters. And um, I was, one of my, I always write about my obsessions, and one of my obsessions is communication or lack of communication or miscommunication when people talk. And so I was kind of getting into that idea somewhat in this story. And the story is, um, it's, I think, what you might call just a slice of life more than um, a full story. It's called Family Reunion. Marion noticed, oh, main character is a woman named Marion. Oh, and I might mention this, too, that um, one of my other obsessions is, if you want to call it that, is, is the family and the changing family, the changing American family. And I think I was exploring some of that idea in this, too. Family reunion. Marion noticed, as she picked up her sweater from the foot of their bed, that the lower drawer of Alan's chest was pulled open. Within it, sorted in neat piles, were Jamie's stuffed toys, games, and books. When she went down to the kitchen, she asked Alan if there was anything she could do to help. Not that I can think of. I called this morning. Jamie's coming in tomorrow on flight 472 from, from Dallas. Rebecca says the layover bothers her some, but I told her I've checked, and the flight attendants take very good care of children traveling alone. He stacked dishes on the counter, briskly rinsing them first under the tap. Will you want to bring him to the reunion then? When is it? Sunday, next Sunday. You want to go? I guess so. It's only once a year, second Sunday in June. It's the only chance I ever see my mom's family anymore, Marion said. We might get some writing time in if we don't go. She watched as he filed last night's dinner plate into the lower rack of the dishwasher. With Jamie here? Jesus, that's right. Angel will be gone, but Jamie will be here. Should I tell Mom we'll go then? I think I'll drive over in a bit. Yeah, get the details. We'll go. Do you think we should ask Mike to let us keep Angel next weekend? I could do that, she said. Yeah, might as well. You sure I can't help you bring up the roll away from the basement? Huh? He wiped the kitchen counter with a sponge. Won't you need help with it? No, sweetheart. Everything is under control. Enjoy yourself at your folks. In the front seat, Angel drew with magic markers into a tablet. The Sunday morning church of the air thundered organ music over the car radio. The preacher read from the Sermon on the Mount. Miriam listened to his voice ring out in holy indignation as he quoted a modern version of the scriptures. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, God's kingdom takes precedence over everything else, occupation, possession, family ties. Believers in God the Father, by identification with the Son, 
become sons of the Father. The result is a brotherhood or family of those who so believe. He went on. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, the master speaks to his servant. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Her father was standing on the landing at the back door of the small frame house, his silver hair shining in the late morning sun. sun. Miriam ascended the steps to the landing with Angel. Howdy, strangers, he said. A light flickered briefly in his dull eyes. Her mother came to the back door to greet them, dish towel in hand. A short, plumpish woman with a perpetual scowl across her brow, she opened the aluminum screen door while Champ, their small Pomeranian, silky brown hair full as a puffball, barked and snapped at Marion's ankles. Come on in, I'll be done here in a minute. Sit down in the living room. Miriam settled into a floral armchair, a crocheted afghan in maroon and shades of orange stretched across its back. Angel spread her tablet and marking pen on the living room floor. So what you been doing, her father asked, taking a chair opposite to sit beneath a set of four embroidered wall panels of the Four Seasons. The dog was yiping still, turning in circles between Marion and her father. He swatted at it with the newspaper. Her mother stood in an archway between the kitchen and dining room, dish towel still in hand. Need some help, Mom? Marion started to rise. No, I'm about done with all I'm going to do here. She folded the towel carefully and laid it on the counter. Her hair, a yellowish gray, held beauty shop waves, but her slacks and shirt were too tight for her bulging round figure and one black slipper was ripped down a side seam. She took a seat on the arm of the couch. So what's new, she asked. Nothing much. Alan's son Jamie is coming tomorrow to stay with us for a month. I've been writing, publishing some. I gave a couple of poetry readings last month. I have another coming up next Saturday. Where's Alan's kid live now, her father asked, scratching his forehead. California, remember? They moved last year. Yeah, I think I remember hearing something about that. Readings, her mother asked. What's that? You know, where I'm invited to read what I write to groups, universities, places like that. You do that? She nodded. The announcement was in the Star all week. Haven't you seen it? No, didn't see nothing like that. Where is this? Saturday at the Sterling Conference Center. Next week's is at Morningdale College. Her father smiled at Angel, a mellow half-smile that revealed a missing upper tooth. You write too? He looked over her tablet. Angel looked up at him. No, that's too boring. I color. Her mother rose from the couch's arm and headed toward the closet beside the front door. She brought out a paper bag with orange, yellow, and brown skeins of yarn poking from it. Angel, you're going to have to learn to do needlework. She set the bag down on the floor and pulled out the roll, spreading it across the frayed beige carpet. Look what I did. It was a latch to a pillowcase of a great horned owl on a branch, the brown feathers contrasting with the gold, yellow, and orange rays that exploded across the background like a sunset. That's beautiful, Mom, Miriam said. Yep, her mother smiled. Angel glanced up from her drawing. Isn't that pretty, Angel? Miriam ran her fingers over the nubby weave. Angel nodded, returning to her tablet. You're going to the family reunion, aren't you? Miriam asked her mother, seated on the floor. I don't know. I told Dad we can't go unless he gets that car washed. Her father looked up from his armchair and grinned sheepishly. It never gets done unless I do it. Her mother's voice grew a sharper edge. Is it going to get washed, Dad? Marion asked lightly. I doubt it. Why should we go? Her mother appeared to speak more to herself than to anyone directly. They don't talk to us when we do see them. They act so funny. When was that? Marion asked. All the time, at Joe Pavlik's funeral a couple months ago, hardly anyone spoke to us. 
Mildred invited us over to sit with them, but we didn't go. Near the front door, a walnut end table hugged the curtains beneath the window. Standing on it were two small vases of artificial roses and daisies. On the wall lining the window hung her father's wooden retirement plaque from Union Pacific, its red stone embedded in a golden spike fastened beside his engraved name. Her mother walked to the table and picked up a vase of flowers. We were going to decorate the graves in Underwood on Memorial Day, but we didn't go. Why not? The rest of the decorations are on the front porch. I did them up myself. Why didn't you go? I don't know. I don't remember what came up. She shrugged and returned the vase to the table. Want some tea? A little glass would be all right. Do you have anything for Angel? How about a little lemonade? She opened the refrigerator door and brought out a plastic pitcher. You make it too sour, Angel said. Miriam smiled, embarrassed. Sugar? She watched her mother pour drinks into plastic glasses, then jumped up to help her pass them around. What's Memorial Day, Mom? Angel asked. It's a day to honor the dead, put flowers on their grave. It started out as a holiday for honoring soldiers who died in war. Are we going to a cemetery? No, we, well, I mean our family, we never go. What will you take if you go to the picnic, her mother asked. I haven't really thought about it, maybe hot dogs for the kids. Angel scrambled to a kneeling position. Let's roast marshmallows and s'mores. What's s'mores? Angel's nose wrinkled. Don't you know, Grandma, you make sandwiches out of graham crackers and marshmallows and Hershey bars? They're good, Miriam affirmed. I might make a pot of spaghetti, her mother said. I don't know why I should bring a big pot of it, though. There's just Dad and me. Ronnie ain't going. Why not, Miriam asked. They didn't go last year either. Ronnie's working that day and Jeff has a ball game in the afternoon. I haven't seen them since Christmas, Miriam said. Her mother nodded. If Ronnie's oldest had lived, he'd be 19 this month. Nineteen, Marion replied. It's been that long? Time flies. I feel like Angel's still a baby. She leaned down to brush her daughter's hair back from her face. Aren't you, honey? Angel smiled, pushing away Marion's hand. Don't hurry her, her mother said. They grow up too fast. I'm not. Don't worry. I don't want Angel to grow up. Let me comb your hair, Angel. Miriam's mother reached into her vinyl black handbag on the floor beside the armchair, pulling out a comb. I don't want my hair combed. Angel swung her head sharply away, her blonde hair falling in straggly wisps across her shoulders. Her mother put the comb down and picked up the latch hook kit, rolling it up. Come here, Angel. I'll tie your hair with yarn for you. I'll give you different colored yarn to take home. You can make something out of it. Champ was licking at Angel's chin. She giggled and slapped at him, her eyes averted. I'll put it in a ponytail, make it look nice. Angel didn't look up. Go on, honey, Miriam urged. She'll make it real smooth and nice for you. I don't want to. Her mother set the yarn on the lamp table next to the comb. She sat very still, slowly sipping a glass of iced tea. Did Mom tell you I won a poetry prize? Miriam turned to her father, his eyes half closed, his head nodding on the edge of a doze. He righted himself with a small jerk. What is it? I told Mom last month over the phone, did she tell you about my prize? Yeah, she said something about that. You always could write good, I remember. What did they give you for it? $450. Is that all? You ought to be making a lot more than that already with all your schooling. Her mother frowned, rose from the chair. I don't know. 450, that's pretty good. It's enough to do something with anyway. She reached into the lower kitchen cabinet and pulled out some envelopes filled, filled between the wood side and a shelf of canned goods. She handed them to Miriam. Four graduations in the family this year. I haven't even sent off any cards yet. Miriam noted the early May dates on the announcement. You didn't send cards? I can do that yet. I can do that anytime. 
Kathy sure is a pretty girl, Marian remarked, holding a colored photograph of one of her cousins in a purple blouse that draped and ballooned around the young girl's wrist. Let's see. Her mother shoved wire-rimmed glasses against the bridge of her nose, squinting at the picture. She looks so much like Esther, Marian said. Oh, do you think so? Something about her nose and mouth. Hair, too. I don't know. Larry's Jean looks a lot like Annie, though. Her mother reached into another envelope, and they both contemplated the young brunette in the photo. Better, I think, Marian said. She's a pretty girl. I think that's all the pictures we got from anybody this time. Marian opened the two other announcements. A note and two photos dropped into her lap. No, Mom, there are four pictures in all. There's a picture of Scott, and here's one of Brad, too. Are there, her mother said vaguely. I just can't believe Elaine has a son graduating from high school already. Look, Angel. Miriam laid a photo on the floor before her daughter. This is my second cousin. His mother is exactly my age. Oh, you're turning 40 this year, ain't you? Her dad leaned forward in the chair. In three more months, Miriam said. Angel told her kindergarten class I was 54. Remember that, Angel? Angel laughed becoming animated. I did. Everyone was asking how old our mothers are, and I said, I think my mom is 54. Miriam laughed. You in fifth now, Angel? Her father asked. She's just going into fourth in the fall, Miriam said. Miriam read the note enclosed with the graduation announcement. Elaine says here she and Mildred are driving up to Minnesota to see Aunt Lou after the reunion, she said. Don't kid yourself, her mother replied. It'll be more than just the two of them going. What do you mean? They'll be heading north. They'll pick up Joe and Franny and Underwood. You wait and see. Maybe they'll invite you. Her mother's lips pressed into a thin, hard line. She rose suddenly. You like plants, Angel? Want to take some home? Yeah. Angel dropped the marking pen she was scribbling with and stood abruptly. Cutworms is getting the peppers, her mother said, pushing open the aluminum screen door. Her father trailed them out to the landing. Champ followed him, bushy tail arched over his back like a squirrel or skunk. These plants are pretty, Marion stopped to admire the numerous planters hanging from an aluminum rod and wrought iron trellis and, and railing that surrounded the landing. I ain't hardly done nothing to them this year. I get tired of working so hard. I get really tired of being the one to do everything. Her father smiled his sheepish grin, loping up the cobblestone walk toward the backyard garden. Let's take some kohlrabi to the reunion if we go. Her mother pointed her father toward a green row of garden plants. Her father stepped into the leaves. Don't walk there, her mother said sharply, but he continued up and down the roads as though he hadn't heard. Get out of there, Dad. She turned helplessly toward Marion. He walks anywhere. He tramples everything. Are those strawberries, Marion asked? Ours don't look anything like that. Angel leaned down to lift the leaves. Ours are tiny. I think the ones we grow are wild, Marion said. At least we didn't plant any. She turned to her mother. They're growing next to the bird bath. The berries are ripening now, we noticed yesterday. Ours are long gone, her mother said. We had some big ones this year. Along a white picket fence that separated the garden from an alley drive, tomato plants grew out of plastic gallon jugs, bottom halves sliced clean against the ground. What are you doing here, Marion asked. I was growing the tomato plants in these jugs. So when I transplanted them into the ground, I decided to leave them. And look how great they look. They do. The heavy leaf growth was covered with blossoms like yellow stars. You ought to get this invention patented, Mom. I ought to. It keeps the cutworms out, keeps the roots warm, and keeps the weeds away. We'll have to see. They look real good now, but it's too soon to tell. Was this your own idea? Yep. Her father stood peeling and slicing a kohlrabi for Angel with his pocket knife. How is it, he asked when she took a bite. It's yuck. It's grody. Is it sour? It's not sour. 
It's just not like I remembered. She tossed the slice into the compost heap against the corner fence. Where have you had them? Marion asked. At Dad's house. He grows them in his garden. Her mother frowned. Mike's still taking her on Sundays, is he? I'll keep her next Sunday for the reunion, and this week he's out of town. Otherwise, he never misses. Would you like to take some home, her father asked. I'm afraid Alan wouldn't know how to fix them, Marion said. Just leave him alone already, her mother snapped, turning away from him. Near the back porch landing, her mother emptied a small planter's contents into a clay pot and handed it to Angel. This is a fern. You can take it home. These are Jerusalem cherries, she said, pointing to a string of tree-like miniature plants on the landing. These are bell peppers. She gestured toward the house. You can divide these ferns up after you get home. See, Angel, they'll get like this. A hanging basket of pale green feathery fronds hung above their heads from the wrought iron railing. Angel admired them, smiling. Cutworms are chewing up these peppers. Her mother stepped from the landing to sift, sipped under a heavy mulch of dried grass clipping, filling the flower bed along the house's foundation. Here's one. She tossed a curled gray worm onto the brick sidewalk and ground it with her heel. She picked another worm from a leaf, throwing it down and crushing it. Look, there's another one, she said, reaching toward the leaf of another pepper plant. Take it, Angel, Marion said. Pick it up. You like worms. I like caterpillars, Mother, not worms. They watched as her mother filled a plastic flat with small plants she dug with a trowel from the bed along the foundation. Want to stay for lunch? She handed the transplanted plants to Marion. We'd better be heading home, Mom. Alan is getting things ready for Jamie's arrival. He might be needing some help. He's pretty excited. He hasn't really talked about anything else for weeks. It's been almost a year since we've seen Jamie. What else you got planned for summer, her father asked, leaning against the railing. Nothing special. The reunion next weekend. I'm hoping to get some writing done this summer. He ran a hand through his silver hair. What kind of things do you write about anyway? Oh, the last poems I published were about Grandpa, about his bees and his apple orchard, about our family reunion, things we used to do when I was a kid, the garden I grew, things like that. Is that right? For a moment, light came into his eyes. You remember all them times? Marion nodded. Champ snapped at her heel and Angel gave the dog a final pat as they moved toward the front gate. I read them, Grandpa, Angel said. They're real boring. Yes. Um, now I said I would read a few more poems, so I'll finish up with uh, a few more recent ones um, than the others that I read. This one is called um, The Bottomizing the House, and in Omaha, um, I'm a member of Landmarks, the landmark organization where they try to save old buildings and old houses and restore them. And um, this poem was based on a house that I visited. It seems like all these houses have stories and they all have histories and they all have, you know, interesting um, little tales behind them. And, and that's what prompted this particular poem, lobotomizing the house, Victorian Queen Anne golden brown gingerbread, the twice-owned house, tallest turret on the left, dominates the terrace corner, tops a register of historic places in town. Mr. Markovsky, the former owner, haunts it still, his ghost reported scene through glazed dormer windows, lacy shadows formed across the filigree and flock of wallpaper in dim halls, deep gold, brass, burgundy. And Jim Fenner's precious wife, mother of three, would haunt it too, if ever they opened closed doors, now 12 years under lock and key. She walked out one day with a summer lover and never returned, leaving sewing patterns clipped to mannequins, gas lights, mahogany buffet, chandeliers, children, leaving husband Jim behind to shut off his burning brain, certain now of only one thing, better a 
better at cuckolding or more forgiven than this hollow a throttle of locked doors stop desires to haunt them all their days. And here is the poem called, this is um, not a recent poem at all, this is one of the early poems that I had published and it's called Wintering at Home. Here in Omaha, winter grows longer every year. The yard stays brown, the earth exposed. Yet in my own remaining, I have grown to hate the sun at times. Its thick brightness, unnecessary, and interference like summer, small swelter of energy that discomforts a soul grown used to darkness, the cool, empty room. Those who winter in the cold are forced into a knowing. And if we do not die of it, we bloom at last like December cacti, like the ones an old crone in the neighborhood brings back each year from Tucson or some city in Brazil where she goes to spend an early Christmas. Home, she sets them down in an empty broom closet, locks the door, and forgets what's planted in perpetual night until, as if by neither plan nor accident, bold darkness forces into fire a brilliant showering of sudden flowers, timely, extravagant. Um, seems like Recently, my poems have um, and it had some political ideas in them, and um, this one was written um, about a year ago. I don't know if you remember um, when the U.S. bombed the, the cities in Libya. That night, we had this really savage storm. And I don't know if you had it here in Lincoln, but. Um, we had flowers blooming and everything in Omaha, and the storm just flattened everything. And somehow those two things um, got mixed up in my mind, which is the way I always start to write about them. But um, maybe you can tell from the poem how this happened. I, I use an epigraph. It's President Reagan upon the U.S. bombing of Libyan cities, April 14, 1986. When our cities are attacked anywhere in the world on direct orders of a hostile regime, we will respond so long as I'm in this Oval Office. And uh, the name of the poem is Spring Storm in Omaha. Out of the north, the west, the whistling wind brought frost, glistening on the garden, stripping tulip beds. Yesterday's daffodil, daffodils, yellow as sun, lay dashed collapsed against walkways, heads battered on cement. Unexpected, this April storm crushed a mellow blossoming, the bursting spring season, geranium red, forsythia gold, lie among the dead. Beyond reason, this cold barrage betrayed hope, flattened the flowering waited for all year, leaving stems, buds, like corpses shattered in wake of attack a wintry hurricane of flesh, bone, strewn in a ray, a sudden slaughter. And um, this poem, um, I'll read two more. Um, this one, I, the idea for this one came when I was doing one of my uh, poets' residencies out in western Nebraska. and. Well, several things actually prompted this poem. One of them was that I saw a picture of a uh, man taking a missile out of a silo. And it's the first time I ever really seen a picture of that. And I thought the thing looked like a whale or a, a strange fish. And I used this phrase, strange fish, in my poem. And then um, I guess another thing was when I was in Scott's Bluff doing a residency, one of the things that I sometimes have the students write about them. These were high school students. Um, I have them project themselves forward about 15 years and then put themselves in the, into a scene and then describe what they're doing in this scene, you know. And usually when you watch the schools, they may see themselves driving a Porsche down the interstate in California or something like that. And in this case, um, there were several students in the class who said they could not see themselves in 15 years. 
And I kept insisting that they had to do this. And um, so then I got all these little poems back from them where they saw themselves with the earth just blackened, with no life around them. Or they were in an underground shelter and couldn't get out because of radiation. And, you know, a remarkable number of, of people wrote that. And so um, I thought it was because they have those missiles out in their backyard. And I, and I asked them that. You know, I said, well, is that because they're all planted out here? And they didn't know. They, you know, but that had never happened before. And then um, going home, I went through Kimball, Nebraska. And Kimball has a highway sign. Kimball's out in the panhandle. And um, the, the sign is, Welcome to Kimball, Oil, Wheat, Cattle, Missile. And I thought that was kind of remarkable, too. Um, you know, like a tourist attraction or something. And so um, I got to thinking about what silos used to mean to a native Nebraska. You know, you talked about silos on the prairie. You knew what everybody was talking about. And now the connotation is different. So um, I wrote this poem, and I called it Prairie Silos. And it's written in a villanelle form. Um, a villanelle is a French rhyme scheme. It's a rather intricate rhyme scheme, and it, um, it gives a kind of a hypnotic effect. You have repeated lines coming through the poem, and um, it's supposed to give that kind of effect. So um, I'll just read it. Prairie Silos. When men give birth in dark hidden caves, it's hard knowing what to expect of rain or strange fish spawned under amber waves. Aswagement of hungers is all. Being craves fires, requires bims silhouetting the plain. Men give birth in dark hidden caves. Cathedrals of plenty rejoice, Jesus saves. Loaves feed multitudes. Fish might disdain these strange fish spawned under amber waves. Roads leading to hell our intention pays. If none eat from our table, who will complain of men who gave birth in dark hidden caves? Wheat fields, gold as Van Gogh, explode. Man raves over phrases. Life's reverence sounds sane. Strange are the fish under amber waves. We bury missiles deep in wells among graves. Death capsules equip bright cylindered grain when men give birth in dark hidden caves and spawn strange fish under amber waves. And um, the last one I'm going to read, um, I wrote this a year ago. It seems like um, my life kind of comes upon me and feasts or famines. And this, I, wrote, I wrote this during a famine period. I was supposed to be finishing up my PhD and um, my car wouldn't run, so I couldn't get from Omaha to Lincoln the, the days I was supposed to go. And then I took a language exam, and the minute, it was a Spanish exam for my foreign language requirement, and I, my score was 480, and I needed a minimum 500 to pass. And it seemed like a number of these things happened. So I started thinking, well, you know, ABD wouldn't be so bad, and I, I just may not finish this. And so, um, that I wrote this poem, and since then, um, my dissertation is done, so it won't be ABD, it may still be ABL, which, which, because I don't have a language that's done, but it won't be ABD. Um, and this poem, I gave it a long title because um, I used to like Bill Clefcorn's long titles, and um, Ludy Jr., do you remember that book? Um, he had a, every title in it with, um, kind of summed up the poem, and I remember some were very funny. One was um, Ludy Jr. disguised as a square knot and filtrates the Boy Scouts. I remember that one. And Ludy Jr., after spending 97 years to the grindstone, admits he has failed in his attempts to reinvent the wheel. And um, so anyway, I gave this a very long title, something I'd always wanted to do, called uh, Upon Considering the Lilies of the Field, Who Neither Toil Nor Spin, I decide to remain ABD. And this has an epigraph, too, um, by Dylan Thomas. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age, that blasts the roots of trees, is my destroyer. And then it has a second one uh, by John Milton. 
they also serve who only stand and wait. I, who once loved earth, dug burial pits for rhizomes, roots, bulbs, sunk fingers into piles of loam, belie the ancient love of dirt with fear of pauper's grave in potter's field, no one to grieve my passing, a dust-to-dust -dust return without a rite, no public stone, no ceremonial coffin, song, or mourning. The tulip drops petals one by one, Jewel leaves, past sunlight, fade, crumble into summer shade. Would I be more or less than momentary, more than Mozart, dumped like dung, beauty cast on landscape, splashed briefly for a song? Would I seize a satin pillow for eternal rest, pews filled with sobbing witnesses, instead of private, slow demise, a soundless, wiser sinking in? melting, merging into earth, away from eyes. I fear I've grown too civilized. If life should grant me one last wish, strip me then of pretense, striving, all that's institutionalized. I'd rather be a flower, a tulip fading in a field, past blooming, bloodless petals dropping, one by one, inconspicuous, disappearing, falling silent to the ground and gentle into that good night.